Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Abby A for Alpha, and I'm going to be hosting Fraser this evening. Um, I thought it'd be nice to kind of start, like, I'm sure a lot of people kind of here know your sound, um, but maybe, you know, to some of the people in the audience that don't, and like we were just talking about that other alias of yours that you had, which I actually didn't know was you until earlier today. Um, but yeah, um, if you can talk a bit about your sound, I guess, um, you know, what, what that's been um, and perhaps some like tracks that define that sound really. Yeah, sure. Um, I just also want to say a massive thanks to everyone for coming out as well. I was waking up a lot last night thinking there was going to be like two people in the crowd and one of them was going to be my mum or something like that. So big up Bristol, thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, uh, so... I've been making music as Fraser Ray for probably about, um, probably about, how many years is that now? About like three, three and a half years before then I was called Soundboy Killer. Um, that was a name I made when I was like 19. Um, it's a name, we were literally just talking about this then, that by this kind of period in time was just giving me the ick quite a lot. Um, I was getting a lot of people coming up to me at gigs being like, yo, mate, oh, Sandboy Killer, yo, that name is so jokes, man, yeah. And I, yeah, it just uh, started to make my skin crawl. Um, also felt a bit uncomfortable about how I spelt it as well. I kind of chose a patois spelling to kind of make sure it was the only Sandboy Killer you found when you search on on Google. Um, and then as I kind of learned more about Caribbean music, I realized that's not really my place to do that. It's not really me. Um, so yeah, over COVID, I decided to kind of have a break. But yeah, I'll talk you through kind of a little bit about um, what my musical journey was. Um, so this first track that I did in 2014 was in my second year of uni. Um, I was living the full uni lifestyle, like staying up till like the sun basically came up every single morning. Um, but what I used to do, I used to live opposite the uni, um, which was Leeds College of Music, um, which is massive if anyone's if anyone's been to Leeds College Music you know how wicked it is um but yeah I used to live like opposite the studios so from about maybe like nine o'clock to 1 a.m every single day I'd just be in there working on music and then I used to make ambient music I used to like make like classical infused ambient music and then um started hanging out with some guys who were really into dance music they were mixing records and I was like this is cool I want to I want to do this they started taking me to some gigs I was like this is cool I want to do this so yeah so basically one day I just sat down um I still remember just did it in my room kind of in like about an hour um and made this track which was yeah the first ever kind of dance track ever made I guess um I'll give you like a little uh I feel that I don't know if that's loud enough for you So that was uh, that, that was kind of the, the the first track I did. I put on SoundCloud um, overnight. It got like 200 plays, and I was like, "Oh, whoa, 200 plays!" Um, and then I sent it out to. I think like the musical landscapes definitely changed quite a lot nowadays. There used to be a real simple kind of easy path for producers to kind of like uh, dance music producers to kind of make it, and that was you would. Um, get your tracks put on like a YouTube channel. Um, so Only Vibes is a massive one. I used um, to listen to that channel all sick. the time it's back a great in those channel. days, yeah. I was also going to say quickly as well, um, you were saying about Leeds College of Music, were you, you, were you studying like a music degree there? Yeah, I did music production. Sick. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was um, yeah, my first time like properly studying music production. I did music A-level. I failed spectacularly um, and just about managed to get into the 
foundation production course just kind of on the merit of my portfolio. I got, I got really, really lucky. Um, I actually teach in a school now um, and I regularly use this like horror story of how badly I screwed up my A-levels with the kids and hopefully it makes a difference. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I kind of like uploaded it. it. Basically the first step to kind of making it back kind of like in 2014 was, I'm oh, sorry, I'll put, my, I'll put my, my face a little bit closer to the mic. Uh, yeah, you, put, you get your music on a YouTube channel. From then you get a bit more attention and there you can like start sending your music to labels, you get a bit more noticed. So I got kind of my first label release. Um, it was a terrible experience. Um, I'm sure every person in this room, one of their earliest musical memories has been a terrible experience. It was kind of like, I got promised a, a release and then about, it took about a year and a half to come out and I'd already told all my friends and my family I was getting a vinyl out. Um, and it was just constantly people being like, where's the vinyl? And I was like, I don't know. And um, yeah, they, it was... Um, it just took really, really long. It was constantly being switched about. I think like my production wasn't actually good enough. I think I got lucky with a couple of tracks and then didn't actually have any other ones to kind of back it up. So there was a lot of kind of working on music before it kind of started to, before I kind of started to develop my sound. Um, and then I think like a good example of maybe where I sort of found that sound was um, this release I did for Warehouse Rave. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Super, super sick label. Yeah, it's a really good label, that one. Everything on it is sick. Yeah, it's run by a guy called D, who is the loveliest guy on earth. Um, but yeah, he, he basically hit me up. He got me to do like a mix for him on SoundCloud. Um, and then I just put a load of tunes in that were mine. He asked me what the IDs were. And um, yeah, then asked me to kind of put together a release. Um, but this is, this is kind of my favorite track off the release. But I'll just give you like a quick 30 second burst. But you can kind of hear it's got a lot of the same tropes that I'm kind of, I've been using that first track that I still kind of use. Um, yeah, it's that kind of it's that kind of breaks Reese vocal sound. That's basically what all my tracks were back then. Um, but yeah, I was kind of like plodding along, like just doing the old release. I don't even think I'd done a gig by that point. I think I'd maybe done like one gig. I did my first ever gig in Leeds for Stretchy Dance Supply, and then Mall Grab played uh, one of my tracks, like an unreleased track, on his. Um, on a boiler room he did in South Back. And, this, and a massive, oh my God, a massive love to Jordan Moore Grab. Like, I think I genuinely owe a lot of my career to him. Like, this was kind of the first time a lot of people heard my music. Um, and I literally remember like waking up the next morning and my Instagram DMs had done the thing where it goes like 20 plus message requests, which I'd never seen before. Um, and yeah, it was like jittering with joy. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, basically he played... He played this track called Burning. Um, I don't know if any of you know it. It's kind of like probably my big, biggest track I've maybe done to date. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of went, it went viral. I had loads of DJs asking me for it. And kind of the gig started coming in after that. Um, got approached by an agency. Um, but yeah, if anyone knows it, it's this, it's this one here. Yeah, sick. So I was just going to say quickly, like a lot of your sound as Fraser Ray then is quite like breaksy, ravey. It's definitely all like quite centered in that older kind of sound, which I think sounds really cool. Um, and it's quite hard to make things sound old, um, but also clean at the same time. So yeah, I, I really like that about it. Yeah, hopefully I'll show you a bit about how to do that later. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk too much because obviously you guys haven't come here to, to hear all about this. You can find all this online. Um, but I'll just talk through kind of maybe some of the other ones and then we can get started doing some um, doing some production. Um, but yeah, I did kind of an album. This is where I kind of decided to change my name. Um, did like a first uh, EP with Outhouse Sounds. Massive love to the Outhouse Boys. They've just been nominated for, uh, I think, DJ Mag Breakthrough label of the year as yeah, well. Yeah, that's the one. Um, couldn't happen to two nicer blokes as well. Um, and then, yeah, recently did a album on Ninja Tune with O'Flynn. Um, O'Flynn actually released Burning, so we've kind of had like a really good relationship since then. Um, we were hanging out loads and then 
I think COVID like started to hit and we were sat on like a group of tracks and nothing else was happening. So we just thought, let's make an album. Um, and then, yeah, recently I've, I've actually started self-releasing stuff on Bandcamp and I've just found like it's, it's a really, really good source of making money nowadays. I think like people don't, don't buy a lot of music nowadays. People stream music and you get 0 0.003 of a penny on Spotify per stream. There's no money in that at all. Um, but people buy stuff on Bandcamp. People buy a lot of stuff on Bandcamp. Yeah, they definitely do. Um, the, the one thing I would say with that, and um, I don't know what your opinions on that are, because I know you were saying earlier on about back in those days, you know, you could get a track on YouTube um, via a channel or something and people could find your music like that. Do you think that Bandcamp has that same kind of power? Because I, I know I do find a lot of music on Bandcamp, like a mixture of self-release and label stuff, but I guess from an artist's point of view, like how, how do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I think like when, when you sell music over Bandcamp, you get like an email alert and you can, you, it tells you whether you've got, you, whether this track's been bought by someone who's following you or whether it's from uh, like the Discover page. What I think like, to like be like honest... fan collections and things like yeah, that Yeah, fan well, collections yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I think to be honest, a lot of them just seem to be people um, hearing it in mixes. They'll hear it in a mix, look what the track list is and then just buy it straight from there. So it will literally just, it won't even say it's from Discover or a... Um, or like a fan page or something like that. Um, a really good tip for anyone who is DJing and is looking for really good tunes, find, like you can see people's catalogs of what they've downloaded or bought on Bandcamp. And like, there will be a DJ out there who has got the perfect taste of music for you. And if you find their Bandcamp, you can just look through all their music that they've downloaded. And like, when you hit a gold mine, oh, you hit a gold mine. Yeah, I do that all the time. It's definitely my favorite Bandcamp trick. Yeah, it's a bit cheeky, isn't it? Really thinking about it, is it but a bit. It's, you can find some pretty big DJs on there as well. I found uh, Moxie the other day, actually. Yeah, yeah. Ben, Ben UFOs on there as well. Joe oh, really? Orbison. Then they're not even that secret. But there was a really good thread, I think, on uh, it might be an identification of music group, like one of the Facebook groups, or maybe new music group when it used to be good. And it was just people linking all the top DJs' band camps, so you could just look exactly what they're buying right at the moment. Yeah, it's a bit cheeky, but. You know, you got to do it somehow. They're, they're you got to out there, music, so yeah. yeah, and it's supporting lots of other independent artists. Um, cool. So, do you want to talk a little bit about? Well, you've yeah, you've just spoken about your your kind of self release. Um, do you want to actually maybe play a, play play that track, and we can kind of like yeah, I guess sure. hear where your sound is now? Yeah, definitely. Um, if it works. I'm going to skip this forward. It's got a really, really long intro. Because we've got some bass on them, haven't they? Yeah, sick. I can still hear that kind of like breaksy influence in there. Um, yeah, that's sounding wicked. So maybe we should jump into some of the production stuff now. Um, I think we were going to start with the drums. Um, and I've got on your list here working with loops. Um, is, that, is that where you want to start or like... Okay, I'm going to run a metronome and we're either all going to go deaf or it's going to be fine. Let's find out. 
Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Sweet. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so this is Ableton Live. I can't actually see a thing, but could I get a hands up, anyone who's using Ableton? Oh, legends. Excellent. If, the, if you not get your hand up, the exit's there, so just make a steady way. Um, no, I'll, I'll like try and talk through what I'm doing. Like, I've got quite a lot of like tricks that I use on the regular, which should be applicable in other DAWs. Um, I've actually started using Logic quite a lot. Um, Boo. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd better leave. Um, but yeah, Logic's really cool. Um, and FL. I think like people don't talk enough about like the actual sound difference between a DAW. Um, and like it, in my head, Logic's re- sorry, Ableton is really flat, which means unless you're kind of like, unless your mixing is quite good or your sound selection is really good or your kind of synthesis is really, really good, you, it's, like, it's actually quite hard to get good sounding music straight from the straight out of the bat. Logic's got a, definitely a warmer sound for me and FL has just got the punchiest sound I've ever heard in my life. Like if you listen to all like the original Hessel Audio stuff that was all made on FL and you can really, really hear that, I think in the production. Um, so I just said, yes, I don't know what, I'm just rambling. Um, I think Abby said no, she was going to stop me rambling when I ramble. But, um, it's a yeah. good ramble. I think it's worth worth saying. I yeah. think like at uni, what they've taught um, us is that Ableton isn't considered like a professional door that would be used in studios for that reason because you can't like mix on it to make it sound as good, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people pick Ableton for the workflow. Is that kind of like why why you use it? Yeah, 100%. Um, I work a lot with audio and I think if you are working a lot with audio and samples, it's a no-brainer. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Um, I'll, get, I'll get cracking anyway. Um, so what I was going to start with is drums. Oh yeah, basically, the concept behind this is I... I don't know if anyone used to watch Against the Clock, which used to be a sick YouTube channel where um, producers would come in, they'd have 10 minutes to make a beat in a row. And um, they used to be really good. And then producers would just start coming up with like a folder with a kick in or a snare in and then like a hat in. And then they would just put them in one by one. And it was basically all pre-made and they'd like rehearsed it. And then it got to the point where they were like, okay, cool, here's my project with basically everything all in. And now I'm just going to like, automate something live and that's the whole thing and you just it was crap you just couldn't really learn anything from it so my basically I've got nothing prepared and um, the plan is that I just make a track kind of on the spot um, show you kind of like it gives you an idea kind of how I work um, a lot of the tricks I kind of use um, Abby's going to jump in I think if uh, if there's anything which you think is particularly valuable um, that I maybe glaze over but um, yeah. yeah sounds good let's do it cool Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start off this this sample pack. If anyone's heard of Jungle Jungle, um, 1989 to 1999, will know it's probably the best like sample pack that's ever been made. Um, yeah, hundred percent. Do you know what? Right, it got taken down because all the samples are sampled directly from Jungle Records. But I think they've just like given up because uh, if you go on. Um, if you go on Bandcamp, it's just there now. Oh, yeah, there you go. It's there. Um, just make sure if you're ever downloading, if you're ever downloading samples from um, Bandcamp, make sure you don't do MP3 because when you export an MP3, it adds a split second of silence before um, before the uh, audio. So if you've got stuff like loops, it's a nightmare, and you'll never have them stay in time. So make sure you do a WAV or AIFF or you know whatever floats your boat. Just not MP3. Cool. Um, what I did with this sample pack, this is a sample pack I used loads for my original music. Um, it's I kind of try and source out breaks that maybe aren't as linked to kind of UK hardcore music anymore. I quite like giving stuff a breaky feel without it making it feel totally hardcore or ravey. Um, but for today, I'll use one of these. Um, what I did was all these breaks are super fast. Apologies, this might be loud. Cool, it's fine. Um, If you start to slow that down, you get loads of artifacts. Um, And I don't make super fast music. I make music about like 1.30. So what I did was I got a mate to run the entire breaks folder through RX8, which is a really good audio processing um, plugin. It's like for for audio repair, but it's got a really, really good warping algorithm. Um, So I got him to basically lower the speed of all the breaks. Um, Is Is that the isotope plugin? I think so, yeah. Can anyone shout out? Is RX8 Isotope? It is. Yeah. There was a thumb. There was a thumb over there. Yeah, I've heard that's very good. Uh, but yeah, basically, I, I kind of slowed everything down, kept it at the same pitch, and it doesn't sound as bad. Ableton's got great warping algorithms, but 
this sounds even better than Ableton, even better than like Complex and Ableton. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through and find a break. Okay, cool. I like, I like that one. Um, I work in arrangement view. Um, apologies, anyone that works in session view, but I can't stand it. Um, so cool. So I'm going to load the break in. Um, oh, I'm going to see if I can do these key, uh, key commands one-handed. Um, big difference kind of in my sound when I moved to kind of making Fraser Ray music was making the breaks a bit more like staccato, a bit more kind of separated. Um, how I did that was by going into the warping whacking it onto beats and then if you're ever using break beats you can basically take all the kind of reverb off them you can take all the kind of like gaps in the sound so I'll just give you a demo of what that sounds like now Um, I really like my music to be rigidly in time as well. And I can see this snare is a little bit out there and that will stop my OCD from killing me. Um, cool, move that there as well. Um, okay, cool. Um, what I'm now going to do is maybe do some chops. I think I might like layer a shaker into it. Um, should I jump in and do that now? Yeah, sounds good. Um, just for sake of time, I'll keep going. Um, I think I might layer like a shaker in with it. Um, and I should have some shaker loops in here. If anyone's using Ableton, this is something I found out from one of Dual Monitor, which is if you just type in like a sample name, I've got so many sample packs here. Um, I've just been like downloading them for years and years and years. And this is just like one of the folders. There's like loads more and stuff. Um, so it's a real nightmare finding stuff. And it's always like clicking through loads of menus. So he showed me and I didn't realize this. You can just go on all results and it basically scans all your um, folders, anything in any of your project files, any like kind of stuff you've rebounced and it'll be there. So what I'm going to do, play the break, just scroll through some shakers, find one which kind of I think fits sonically and then yeah, throw that in. So this one looks like it's got quite a nice waveform, which is why I brought it in. It was just really, really quiet. Let's see if it works. No, it sounds crap. Cool. Let's keep searching. There we go. Cool. Um, you can see, like, with the Shaker's waveform, it's pretty, um, it's pretty all over the place dynamically. And that, like, for drums, it, I mean, it's cool, but I don't think that's going to work personally for drums. So what I usually do is just tame the. I'm pretty, I'm pretty full on. Like, I'll just tame the highs with like a what's called a limiter. If anything goes over a certain threshold, it will just squash it right down. Um, and that basically means I can just kind of tame all these peaks. It's definite like there's a lot of mixing engineers in here who will be cringing at me doing this, but it's quick. It kind of works for me. Um, so I'm going to tame these highs now and just basically get so it's a nice kind of chunky, flat sort of shaker um, loop. And yeah, I noticed as well you pitched it up a little bit too. Do you do that quite a lot with your different like loops and sounds? Yeah, I'm constantly pitching stuff. I've got like I've got a really bad ear. Um, everyone who or all my mates know this. Like my actual knowledge of tonality is absolutely terrible. So like I do always pitch stuff and I try and do it as quickly as possible because the moment I listen to stuff for like you know five minutes, it's locked in there and then I just hear it as like yeah, that's a really nice harmony. So when I was doing the album with O'Flynn, who's got 
brilliant ears the amount of stuff he would send back to me being like how are you hearing this in key at all um so yeah i have to do it super super quick it's like the first sort of thing that i do cool i'm just gonna eq that shaker as well just take out a bit of the low end um oh it's got not that much low end cool and maybe boost the highs a little bit cool um, I use ProQ if anyone um, uses ProQ I've got ProQ too so it's not the best one but it's the best sounding EQ I've ever kind of used in my life um, let's hear how it sounds with the break uh, cool what I'm going to do now is add some reverb onto the shaker um, this is something I really recommend doing regardless of what DAW any DAW can do this which is make set uh, effects. If you always use the same reverb, if you use pretty much the same settings on everything, make a uh, make a reverb kind of like preset that you use. So I use the Valhalla reverb, um, and I've literally got it there. Those are the settings that I use, and then I can just drag that straight on a return channel, and then I don't have to set up my reverb. I also do the same with. So I'm going to try and keep my mouth as close as possible. Um, I also do the same with delay as well. Um, this is a sick delay that I absolutely love, which was made by some guys just into like dub music, and he just put out loads of free plugins. It's only on Windows, and it's only 32 bit, so I had to like convert it to 64 bit, but. It sounds really, really cool. But anyway, let's add some reverb to the shakers. Can we hear that? Yeah, cool. That'll do. Um, yeah, I mean, these are like loads of kind of other presets I do. They're almost like my most used plugins. But like if I go to my user library, these are all like loads of other stuff that I've kind of made and then I will use regularly and then just keep them there for when I need them. We'll visit that in a bit. Um, I think one more thing I'm going to do is layer a kick with this. Um, how are we doing for time? We're about halfway through. All oh, right, let's speed run this beat. Let's not bother with a kick. Let's just put like a nice EQ shelf on it um, at the bottom just to uh, so we can give ourselves some room under for a bass line. So you can see there's loads of frequencies here. Cut them. Like, just anything under, like, 20 hertz, just cut it. It's the, it, No speaker in the world can play it. All it will do is just kind of clog up your low end if you're... and make 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 your master basically quieter. Um, it makes it more difficult to kind of mix. Right, let's run through. Let's... I'm going to grab a vocal, I think. Yeah, vocal was the next bit on the list, like time stretching. Yeah. Um, does anyone in here know about Tracklib? Has anyone heard about Tracklib at all? Oh, no. cool. There was one hand, I think. So, oh, yeah, cool. Two hands. Nice. Um, basically, I used to use splice loads um, and I've gone off it because there was some really, really cool vocals on there. But I, and I made like a track that I spent like two months on. It was like my masterpiece. It was like symphonic speed garage with like sick vocal. I was like, this is it. This is it, guys. I'm, gonna, I'm making it. I'm, I'm making it. And then um, I heard a track on the radio with the exact same vocal and it crushed me emotionally. Um, so it's basically made me realize that anyone can use those samples on Splice. There is a way that apparently, um, Denim Audio actually told me this, who I think is coming to do a talk. Um, have I just, yeah, is that am I allowed to say that? I don't know. Yeah, anyway, I think he might be doing one of these, maybe, who knows? Um, but, uh, he, he told me that, uh, there's the Overmono track, So You Know, which goes, I need you get to me, and so on. Um, they, actually, they actually asked Splice to take that down because they use that in So You Know. And I think they might have paid to do that. Um, there is definitely a way if you use a vocal on Splice, if you're a big enough artist, to take it down so no one else can use it. But if you're using stuff off Splice, anyone can use it. Um, and there's not that many good vocals on there as well. So what I've been doing is using a site called Tracklib where um, labels and artists will basically post their back catalogue um, and they'll post all the stems. Um, so I'm just going to click on something random um, and, it's, and it's just like a sample gold mine. So um, let's listen to this, why not? Oh, it won't play because it's Nick. Oh! Cool, that's the master. I can download that sample or I can download any of the stems. So like, here's the vocal harmony part. 
just because of time, I won't go into like how the licensing works, but like basically you pay a £50 one-off fee. Um, depending on the license, some of them are more expensive. I don't bother looking at the more expensive ones. I'm not rich. Um, but like, yeah, and depending on how much time in the sample you use, you give that percentage of the royalties. But basically, this library is huge and it's really good. It's really, really high quality. Um, so I found this vocal the other day. I know I said it wasn't going to pre-prepare anything, but like, you know, I thought I'd just use this vocal. Um, it's not going to play, but that's fine because I downloaded it. Uh, I'll drag that in now. Um, and this is kind of how I work with vocals that I import into a project. So this is the vocal. Um, you can tell me whether or not you think it's good. Uh, here we go. I think Yeah, it's not mind-blowing at the moment, but let's have a listen to it with the beat. So what I usually do is get like an acapella um, and I'll just play the beat throughout the whole acapella and I'll just sit there and like just drink my cup of tea or something like that. Or um, like if I'm at home and I've, there's a cat near me, the cat's on the lap for that bit. Um, and yeah, basically what I'm listening for is just any moment where I hear like a syllable or like a phrase that works particularly well over the beat. Um, so let's have a listen through. I mean, I'm already hearing like syllables that I kind of like. So what I'm going to do is I create like an extra audio channel below and then I just drag the little bits of sound that I like um, through. like that bit there as well um sweet that was really quick uh i've been doing this a lot i've been doing this for like eight years so i've yeah i've got a lot of practice just kind of like trying to listen for like little snippets of sound i think it works when i'm like chopping up bits of vocal as well um okay now what i'm gonna do now i've got like some bits of vocal that i like i'm just gonna like loop them over a smaller bit of the track like this um whoops Apology, this is, there's nothing worse than like watching someone like get something wrong on a computer and you're like, oh, oh, just use the key command. Cool. Um, now I'm just going to like try and rearrange some of this vocal um, and basically get, just get a groove going. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about kind of how I process my vocals. Um, sweet. Let's just get a little vocal groove. really strict with my warping um i I'm, I, I like i'll use my ears but i also use my like eyes quite a lot and look for look for kind of like these peaks from like each syllable and just make sure they're on the grid basically i think it's really really important i don't get me wrong i really like kind of sloppy sleazy dance music but i think with the music i make it has to be meticulous it has to be like militant those like um the kind of rhythms to make them just basically hit in a club um cool i think that's a hook um, what I'm going to do with these is use them as like vocal shots maybe send them to a delay and then while that kind of vocal is running maybe I'll chop the vocal up a, bit, a little bit as well those delay kind of hits can go over the top and they'll just keep the vocal sounding a bit fresh so it's not just the same thing running
Um, cool. I actually like, yeah, I think what I then might do is start to think about, I'll then, I'm now just going to basically pitch all these vocals together, um, make sure they're warped so they're not changing kind of the lengths. Um, and then I think it's really important to like pitch your drums. I think if, you, if you're having a session with a, with a drummer, they'll pitch the snare, they'll pitch the toms. They, uh, I think that's actually all they do. They actually, they just pitch the snare, what I'm on about. Anyway, but they, they, it's really important to get a snare in tune. It's like one of the reasons why a lot of people's snares in band recording sound terrible is because they're out of tune. Um, it's something definitely not talked about, I don't think enough in dance music, about pitching your drums to what's going on around it. Um, so I'm going to just pitch the vocal up and down and then see if it snaps in with the drums a bit better. Yeah, cool. I think I like that a bit more. Um, this is a plugin I use called... Elastic, um, which is, um, if anyone's ever heard of formant filtering, filtering is this idea that you, uh, or changing the formant of a vocal. So tam the timbre thing here, basically you're changing the formant. It's basically like a way you can keep a vocal the same pitch, but change the like the vocal style, you can make like a man's voice sound like a woman's voice, or you can make a woman's voice sound like a man's voice, or like some, make someone's voice like, sound like a child. Um, so I think that's really useful. If you're like pitching something to match it with your drums, your other elements, and it's too high or too low sounding, and it starts to sound like a chipmunk or like someone talking like this, then um, you can just change the foreman, and it will just basically means you, you can put anything at any pitch, change the foreman, and then it's, I'm rambling. I'm just going to do it. No, you're not. That's really, really useful. Because that's one of the things I always find with changing vocals. I'm like, why does it sound, yeah, like a chipmunk or a low rumbling voice? So... Definitely a good tip. What's the plugin called, if anyone wants uh, to? Know? It's called Elastic, which I believe this algorithm that's in here, this pitch algorithm, they actually do Ableton's pitch algorithm, but Ableton doesn't have formant control native built in. Um, this is like a drastic one. If I want like a bit more of a subtle sort of formant change, I'll use um, this old um, like auto tune plugin that I use. It's also, that's also quite good as well because it just does a little bit of gentle auto-tuning. Um, I'll just use Elastic for now. Um, there is a problem with this plugin, which I'll let you know if it happens. Um, let's find out. Ooh, and let's also play it from the start. So you can kind of see it's like changing the pitch of it. Uh, not the pitch, the, like the, the vowels of it. And it kind of just takes a little bit of the brightness, the harshness off it as well. Um, there is a problem with this plugin, which I don't know why mine does it, where if you if you like hover, this is so nerdy, but hopefully, at least if one of you enjoys this, it's worth it. If you hover over your plugins in Ableton and look at the bottom left, it tells you how much delay compensation there is for latency on a plugin. Um, so like this plugin is introducing a quarter seconds worth of delay because of how much processing it's doing. So what Ableton very cleverly does is adjusts for that. Um, some plugins that don't do much delay at all, some do loads. The problem is my Elastic plugin, for some reason, adds less, like more delay than it should. So like it moves vocals forward in time. So I might have to resample it. Let's find out. Cool, it sounds fine. Let's hear it with the rest of the beat. All right, cool. Um, let's add some bass. Should we do bass? Or like yeah, pads bass. or something? Should we do some bass? Cool. Um, what I used to do loads with my bass lines is I used to basically, this is this is a big secret of mine. Uh, I just used to use the Ray Keith Terrorist bass, um, which if you don't know what that is, that probably sounds really aggressive, but it, there is a tune called Terrorist where... Um, it basically just has this cutout bit where it's just the bass and it goes like um, and it should sound like this. Yeah, it's a nice, oh, it's a good bass sound that. So what I used to do is literally just whack it into a sampler like this um, and if I play the sampler, it's not great because it's playing two notes. So what I literally just used to do is just loop the first, um, just the first bit of it like this here. So I'm just putting the fades, just putting the loop on, and now it should just keep playing. 
the screen recording is on I believe I think yeah I'm not okay cool I put it on it was definitely up here a minute ago oh okay sick sand um, cool so there's my bass and now I can change the pitch um, problem is with that is it's it's a sample so it's, it's super muddy and I found out the hard way that if you play that in a, in a club it will it sounds great at home and then at a club it's just all a jarbly mess if you're doing sub bass you have to use sine waves um, they hit so much harder if you listen to any like dub music on a sound system you know and there, there's no harmonics to the bass it's just a sine wave and it absolutely slaps it rattles your chest this isn't chest rattling at the moment so what I'm going to do is layer a, a sub um, just a sine wave under it just to kind of mirror the notes it's doing um, what I've just realised is uh, this isn't playing C at the moment but luckily I've made my own version of it over here which um, I'm pretty sure it even has a tuner in just so I can keep an eye on where it is so that's basically what I did I just looped that first note I've got like a nice EQ like emulating a pull tech um, which just sound nice on the low end there we go and there's my sort of bass cool um, I'm just going to improvise come up with a bass line let's see what happens Um, Ableton's got a sick thing if you didn't know it this little button up here uh, just basically will capture exactly what I just jammed and it's already in there now so like I, I used to have this so much I don't know if you've had it Abby where you're, like, yeah, you're playing something it sounds so sick and you're like cool I'll record it and you've forgotten what you've done or it never sounds or you just can't just do it the same again yeah fully yeah um, cool I'm going to clear out the MIDI the top note I did I wasn't happy with at all I think it like I was only doing it on a computer keyboard um, I think it actually might have suited maybe like being an octave up there. Cool. Edit them. Right, let's have a listen to the bass line. Cool. Um, I'm going to add a that sine wave bass. Um, so anyone who's familiar with synthesis um, and anyone who's not familiar with synthesis, a sine wave is basically kind of like a pure, clean sound, which sounds like this. Um, but yeah, if you play it super low, it sounds pretty nice. Um, so I think if this is in like the correct tuning, I should just be able to copy this down um, and then just give that like fat sub layer under it and maybe do like a little cut so I've not got too many clashing sub frequencies. Let's find out. I don't know how good this will be to mix on. Pitch these down an octave. Uh, I might just use a saturator as well, just to bring out a little bit of kind of harmonics on this super low bass one as well. Um, Soul Mass Transit System told me about this. If you put a sinoid fold on, um, like on just like sine waves, it just brings out all these harmonics. I'll, I'll play it for you now. Um, here we go. Cool. There we go. And now with the Reese. Cool. There we go. Um, let's now hear that with the beat. I might turn them down slightly as well. Um, cool. Uh, Right, what else should we do? And also that, that sub that you did, that was in, uh, was that Wavetable? Yeah, that's on, in Wavetable. Do you, do you might make most of your stuff on, on Wavetable that you would be doing like with Synthesis or do you use any other plugins like Serum or whatever? Yeah, my, my kind of biggest use plugins for, um, for kind of writing uh, like kind of melodic parts are, I've got Omnisphere. Omnisphere is unbelievable. Um, it's a real like power drainer though like um or like cpu drainer it it like i've only got an eight gig ram laptop like it's a miracle it's still working on stage right now but like 
Um, if I put like two or three in instances of Omnisphere, it just kind of kills it. So I usually save that for like real epics or pads or like really, really important kind of complicated parts. I do find myself using a lot of Wavetable. I've just started using Vital. Um, if anyone's heard of Vital, like, yeah, this guy over here is loving it. Um, uh, he's loving it because it's nothing serious. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's sick. It's like it's basically like Serum and Massive, but like a better version, and it's free. Um, yeah, it's it's super cool. You can do like FM synthesis and stuff with it as well, really easily. Like getting one um, wavetable to like modulate another one and getting like harmonics from it. Um, but the big thing, like I think, a big thing for me is the synth has just got to have like a filter that actually responds when you. Um, like you can actually see a filter move. I think like if I can't see that, I really, really struggle. So like I, if my filter's like opening on a note, I want to be able to see that like kind of like this. Um, so if I gave it some harmonics, I think unless I can see a filter moving like that, I don't really like it. I guess that's a tricky thing with Massive, isn't it? Like you can't really see very much on there. I know a lot of people like Serum because it's like very visual. Um, but yeah, I've heard, like, I have used Wavetable a bit, but it seems to be, like, pretty powerful for making a lot of different things. And I guess it being in Ableton, it's just quite sim simple to drag it in and it not drain too much of your CPU and whatever. Um, cool. Shall we move on to... Well, actually, the next thing that we had was, like, more of the melodic elements. Um, and also, um, I think something here you said about the, like, yeah, scale finder and, like, expression control, like, with the melodies. Yeah. Um, what I will do is, I think, yeah, I'll quickly create, like, a melodic part. Um, <clears throat> I'll... Let's have a think. I will... Yeah, let's try it like this. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll make a synth. Do we have like a... Rec would, if anyone yells out a synth, I can have a go making a part in that if there's like one in particular that most people are using. Vital, should we do it? Okay, cool, great. This is me when I've just realised now that I don't actually use Vital that much. So well, let's see what happens. Uh, I think it's in my VST3. Who makes it again? It is, yeah, there we go. Two points to to you and zero points to me. Um, cool. Okay, cool. Usually what I do, just nice and simple, is just get like a nice preset that, and then I can just start to kind of edit. I think like, in my mind, I'm thinking like for this sort of vibe, maybe something like pads, some like ble dreary sort of pads might be really cool. I think from then, once I've got those pad parts, I can then start to kind of create maybe some arpeggios or like some kind of like hooky sort of melodies from there. Um, so let's do that. Let's um, find some pads. Cool. Um, God, there's hardly any presets on this, is there? Sweet. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, right, I'm going to put the mic down and just get, get playing. I'm going to like move my keyboard up an octave by pressing X and then start to play some high notes. So I, I think like 
a lot of people who are classically trained on keyboards will instantly go to start doing three note chords. Um, some of the most beautiful chord patterns I've ever heard from O'Flynn, funnily enough, who doesn't play keyboard at all, are just two notes. And like, there's something really magical about not kind of giving away too much about your harmony and just doing like nice little two note sort of things. Um, yeah, cool. Um, I'll create like an additional part and then we'll look at creating some additional like melodies to kind of go with it. For, oh, sorry. Apologies for everyone there. That must have been incredibly painful hearing me do that. Um, right, let's uh, let's give this. A go. I think it's actually an F, wasn't it? So at the moment, the filter is being kind of modulated by the LFO, um, which is really cool, um, that you can kind of change the shape of the LFO in Vital. Um, and you can get some, like, you can even add, like, some kind of additional sort of sounds. Um, it's really cool for making dubstep. Um, if there's any dubstep heads out there, you can literally map your kind of entire rhythmic um, sort of riff within there, have it kind of modulating loads of different things and get some big, big old womps. So like, you know what you're doing there with the chords, um, you know, to try and find notes that work together. So do you just literally play play the different keys and then until you hear what you like, just go with that? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. You don't use the like scale function on Ableton yeah, you, or anything like that? You can use a scale. I, to be honest with you, I always use, uh, without going like really deep into music theory, um, I just only use the white notes. Um, and the reason is, is because... The white notes doesn't just limit you to A minor or C major. It also means you can have music. If, you're, if your kind of fundamental root note is E, you're in E Phrygian, which kind of most techno is kind of written in. Um, I just quite like kind of following my ear. I mean, we're using C. This definitely does fit. Do you know what? I actually already hate this part. I think it feels really, really cheesy. I kind of want to just like completely gut this. But we'll keep it for time. Um, but yeah, you, I, I just kind of follow my ear, definitely. Um, I, think, I think that's really important to do. I think the moment you start to like lose the flow and overthink what you're doing kind of too much in Ableton, you lose all creativity. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of that older kind of 90s style music as well, people weren't really using keys very much. You know, it's kind of sampling something and playing around with it and, and seeing where it goes. And some of the best ideas were kind of created from that limitation in a way, I suppose. And like you said, just, just letting it flow really. Um, so I think the last kind of thing that we had was like, you know, building up towards drops and things like that. Obviously, we've only got like a small section, but... Um, oh, we can make a drop out of yeah? that. Yeah, let's cool. do it. Okay. Um, uh, I think like a big, big idea I've always thought about with drops is is like dynamic change. Um, I really like having kind of moments of like where everything sort of drops out just before it kind of hits in. Um, I'll show you some of my tricks to how I kind of get this to work. There's also a sample pack that I absolutely adore that I've used in every single track since I was like since I was a little boy, which is um, it's one of the Vengeance packs called uh, Vengeance Effects Volume 1. I think it's actually... T oh, yeah, and there's Vengeance Sound Effect 2. Um, but yeah, it's just basically full of sounds like this. And like lots of them are really, really, really cheesy, but some of them are sick. 
And like usually I'll have a track and it'll have probably about 20 of these really, really subtly in there. Um, and they just, just give like a sense of energy. And like you won't even notice that they're there a lot of the time. The moment you can start to notice them a bit too much, they're already too cheesy, they're already too obvious. But really subtly there, they can kind of add a lot. But yeah, I'll, I'm going to put the mic down, do a really quick kind of arrangement going to the drop. Um, I said I was going to chop this vocal as well. Maybe I'll do that just before it kind of drops to kind of give it like a kind of a, like an exciting kind of standout moment. Um, let's find out what happens. So let's aim it that bar nine is where the bass comes in. That's where it'll drop. Um, and then I think that probably implies that we don't want any drums before the drop. Um, I'll save the vocals that are kind of doing the washy, splashy delay stuff for that, um, for this kind of breakdown before it happens. I, I absolutely hate this pad, um, but we'll keep it in. We'll keep it in. Uh, we can make it a bit more like dissonant. No, no, no. Let's just leave it. Um, you can get rid of it if you want. You don't have to keep it. Yeah, I think. Yeah, what I usually do is the, as the starting point, the first thing I write is the, the kind of main element, the drop. Um, and that's like, I think it's really important to get get that groove down. And then you've once you've got that down and you've got something you're really happy with that you think you could dance in the club to, that you think other people could dance in the club to, it's then almost like you've got what you're aiming for and then it's just kind of about how you're going to get there. Um, you obviously, like I think it's really easy with dance music, you want a nice intro with drums so a DJ can mix it in. Um, and then you're kind of like stepping about building the kind of energy towards that moment. Um, I'll, I'm going to get rid, I'm, I am going to get rid of those pads. Um, I don't know whether you meant to make me feel that. I don't know whether you're telepathic, telepathically saying, but thank you. Mm. Yeah, I think like it's definitely the writing process. I think the, the structuring should feel easy. It should feel intuitive. Um, yeah, I mean, I might get like, yeah, I think like it was something I was thinking about doing today, but I just, I, I didn't know what the track was going to sound like, so I couldn't really be bothered. But I usually will have, if, I, if I'm using a track as a, an example, I'll literally have that in the project um, and have it muted. And then I'll like, I'll, I'll have it warped to the tempo so I can kind of see the phrasing of where stuff's happening. But really, really importantly, I'll also reference it for the mix down and I'll be constantly flicking between it, making sure it's at the same volume as mine, but instantly it'll show, oh, my vocal's way too loud or, oh, wow, how is their bass is hitting way harder than mine? I need, I need to do some EQing on mine. Um, I think, yeah, I, I want to kind of aim for this point and I think as long as I've got a good drop, like a good build-up going into that, half the work's done, like that, that, that loop could probably last for another eight bars before something needs to come in or maybe something drops out. Um, one thing I used to definitely do when I started making music is write the drop and then very quickly write a B section, which was still kind of rhythmic, still use the same exact drum beat, like a very, very similar bass line, just with like one other element. And then once you've got like an A section and a B section, you can just keep going between, the track just writes itself really. You can just like do the odd kind of interchange with layers. Um, as long as you've got like built up a lot of layers as well, if you've got like 10 tracks that you all know play perfectly together, you can just be interchanging them. Um, like if you're thinking about structuring as well, one thing you can do is called subtractive arrangement where like if I played that to you now, it would be boring as hell. It would just be the same thing over and over again. Um, but what you can do is just uh, duplicate everything and then just start deleting stuff at random. Um, and then what you'll find is that like while you're listening through, one of those sections might sound really, really cool. Another section might sound crap and you just get rid of it. Um, but you, you already that's starting to look like a structure and I've not even listened to it. And then you kind of listen through to kind of see, see what works. Um, I'll just give you like a quick like thing about maybe going into the drop um, and just get this like vocal looping or something like that. Like... Uh, maybe like a time stretch as well to get like that jungle sort of feel. Um, what I, so what I usually do, if you want to get that like, you, you know the one I mean from like jungle, uh, you know, you've heard it. Uh, if you like consolidate your sample oh, uh, and then you put it on texture um, like this and then when you start to time stretch it, so this is my first warp marker. If I put another one here, I can just start dragging this out like that. Or if I want to be lazy, I can just pitch up, the, like do the BPM. Um, and then, is this it here? Where was it? 
yeah, of course, there. And then now that is going to be one long vocal. We can make that longer. We can make that more. We can make that. Let's really ruin someone's evening with this vocal. Uh, cool. So we can stretch that. And then if you play with these settings here, you can basically make it sound really jungly. Cool. Um, yeah, that is definitely going to give someone a heart attack, isn't it? Uh, so what? Yeah, what I'll, what I'll kind of do like before a drop is maybe give like yeah, definitely like a moment where people are like, in the club are like, whoa, what's just happened there? Um, so maybe I'd have that time stretch vocal, and then I've been really enjoying the new Pangea album and the way he chops vocals. So maybe like I'll do like some very very quick vocal chops with this, as simple as like maybe just like duplicating them in here. So I don't know how this is going to sound. Um, I'm going to automate as well this like delay for this long like time stretch re um, time stretch thing. So if you automation is basically automatically changing a parameter, it used to be done by hand in the studios. Now you can just get a computer to do it. I use tons of automation in stuff like build ups. Um, I'll constantly have stuff changing, like whether it's like a track's volume or whether it's like an EQ, just like taking out some of the low end gently so that when it hits, it slaps a lot more. I think EQ is really, really important um, in your music. Just, um, yeah, just experiment around. Just find out what exactly you can automate. You can basically just click any part of the plugin um, and then it'll jump to there and you'll be able to automate it. Oh, let's do that. Let's change the the formant on the vocal. Let's make the, the vocal sound like it's getting like, um, becoming more and more kind of high pitched and um, yeah, using that kind of elastic plugin we talked about. So cool. Let's, I don't know how this will sound as a build up. I'm going to put in one of those like subtle kind of uplifters. Cool. Let's use, oh, that's not very subtle, is it? Right. We're doing that. Cool. Let's see what happens. Okay, cool. Uh, so this would maybe be my build up to the drop. It's not the best. Um, I think actually if I was thinking about that, if I was going to change that, I think you want your music to be danceable in a club and I think that comes out of nowhere. I think people on the dance floor would like jerk into that and be like, whoa, what's happening? So maybe actually I'd want to do something very rhythmic before the drop so that people are really, really aware um, where that beat is so they can kind of launch themselves into it. Um, I think if you're making dance music, it's really useful to think about how it's going to translate on a dance floor. Um, yeah, I think I could definitely spend a lot more time on this. It might just take a little bit more longer. Yeah, I totally get you. But they're, they're, those are the ideas there, you know, like automation and time stretching and that sort of thing, chopping up stuff. That's really cool. Um, I think we're at time now for your demo, but um, ready for some questions now for the last half an hour. Was that all right? I don't, I don't actually feel, I don't know if I actually, that was, that was any use to anyone here, but I'm hoping it I was. I personally thought that was useful, but I'm obviously not going to speak for everyone here. Cool. Has anyone got any questions? Um, yeah, I think like, first off, think about what aspect of production you want to get into. If it's kind of electronic music production, um, start thinking about what sort of style you'd quite like to make. Um, I think it's, I, th uh, I think if you're looking to get into like engineering, start talking to people that you know who are like in bands. If you're looking for more like a conventional sort of mixing, um, mixing sort of approach. Um, I think it's something I, I really touched on at the start, which was, just experiment and um, the only reason I kind of fell into dance music was just that one off kind of making a track like if I hadn't made that track I'd probably probably still be sat making ambient music like with like birds and washes um, and I don't know how that would have gone for me um, but uh, it, it wasn't very good for ambient music so probably not very well um, but yeah experiment because I think you like like making music's really really fun it feels like you're playing with lego um it just feels like there's endless possibilities you're just like putting blocks together um and it's 
yeah, I think just just throw yourself into it. I think it does take time as well. If you want to get into production, you need to basically get into a point where you're not really thinking about what you're doing in the DAW. If you're thinking too much about what you're doing, you start to slow down. If you want to put a synth in um, to make like a pad um, and you don't know how to do that and you have to look it up online, it's going to slow down your creative juices. Um, I think it was one of the old Chicago like original heads, maybe like Farley, Jackmaster Funk used to talk about like a flow state, which is um, any any top producer in the world will tell you about this, which is this idea that you, um, this idea that like all your best music will be written without even like thinking about it. You, everyone's best tracks they ever wrote would only take two hours to write. All those kind of like tracks that I put on the timeline here, pretty much every single one of those tracks, maybe except for um, You Need Me, that I did with O'Flynn, all of those took about two hours to do um, because, and I can't remember doing them. They were like like full transcendental, is that the right word? How do you say it? It's <laughs> like I was in a trance basically making them. And, it, and I think if you, if you get taken out of that trance by like having to wonder how you do stuff in music, it stops you being able to make music. Um, so yeah, I suppose my advice would be get stuck in, make as much music as possible, learn your DAW to a point where it's instinctive and you're not having to think about what you're kind of doing within there and the tracks will just start to flow completely out. And may maybe with that flow state thing, um, I know some people use like templates and things like that in Ableton, don't they? Like just all the different things that they use a lot, saving them, saving the samples that they go to use a lot properly, like not having them in random folders that are hard to access. Um, and yeah, I guess saving a lot of presets and, and kind of sounds that you like, it kind of makes it flow a lot better. I think that is the one benefit of Splice, is it if you do need a certain sound, it is quite easy to find it straight away. Um, but there's definitely like the issue that you were mentioning earlier where you could have a lot of the same things as other people. Um, has anyone else got any more questions? Yeah, I think like it's really, e if you listen to a lot of like, jump up drum and bass they're the loudest tunes possible because they feasibly can be because there's like three elements in there the, the more elements you start to add the busier a piece of music is the more difficult in my understanding the more difficult it is to get it louder um, when what I do I'll see if I right this will, this will either kill my laptop or take about two minutes to come on but I'll see if I can pull up my mastering chain um, so I, I never used to master my own music um, it's something I constantly experimented with but then I kind of like maybe over the last year or two um, yeah basically kind of just got this chain that seems to work really really well with my own music but, I'll sh but basically I don't necessarily want to show you that much about what's going on it's mainly just kind of like EQing um, like pushing it a lovely ozone preset but the main thing that's worth looking at is your LUFs I don't know if you've heard of that um, before but it's basically your uh, it's basically a way of measuring the loudness of something um, so what you can do is basically whack that on your master. So at the moment that was going to four LUFs. That's way, 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 way too loud. You want to be kind of like aiming for, if it's a dance track, maybe like seven will absolutely bash in the club. Six will annihilate in the club. Five will ruin someone's life again. Um, if you're, if you're mastering for Spotify, you want kind of between like minus eight and minus 12. But it's worth like, if you're doing any self-mastering, I don't know if that's what you, in, in what sort of context you mean, just just have an LUF. Um, like that's, that's I think that's what changed up for me was just having this sort of target to aim for. Um, and then from there, the ozone presets are brilliant. I think it's really worth knowing what you're doing within those presets. It's it's worth just like learning to master with the stock plugins so that when you use a preset, you can identify something's over compressed and you can identify, oh yeah, cool, I need to adjust the threshold. Or you um it's it's you're losing a lot of the transients on your drums and you realize that actually you just need to like push back the attack on that compressor a little bit more. Um that knowledge comes with a lot of learning on the stocks and then once you've got that you can then utilise them with the kind of bigger ones but yeah I've, oh yeah look I've even got a little note for myself on there seven loves max um, but yeah just like find any if you're in Logic Logic's got a loudness meter which measures in loves uh, ozone uh, you have to like change the input and output on here and put it on there's a, there's a free plugin you can get which um, shows you what your loves are called Ulean loudness metering or something like that um 
yeah, I use that quite a bit, which is really helpful, really easy to use. And I just put a track in there that I liked and I kind of aimed for. It's actually a soul mash track. Um, and yeah, I kind of like aimed for that level like every time I'm mastering something. But yeah, I think also one more thing is if it's not hitting as loud as another master you got as reference, it's usually 99% of the time it's a mix problem. Um, and my gut instinct is probably that it'd be a low end problem where you've maybe just got a little bit too much low end or... Uh, I think it's really easy to put too much low end in the track. It might also be, I don't know if you're like high passing it above 30 hertz, but if you're not, that can sometimes really quiet down your master as well because you've got all these like inaudible frequencies sort of like um, fighting against everything else. Any more questions? Quite a few. It depends how deep, it depends how deep you want to get and philosophical. Um, Yeah, I think like music's all about context and um, like like tonal context. Like I think like if I if I play this now, we could probably all like hum a note of what probably the root is of this piece of music. I think like probably what's giving it away is the the maybe the fact that it's in like it's got an E in the bass line. I think like most of us would hum the note E. Um, and we kind of see that kind of tonal tonal center as being E. I imagine what you're probably doing is dragging in a sample that might be in um, it might be an E major. Let's say let's say, let's pretend this whole piece was in an E major, um, and you've dragged in a sample that uses all the notes in the scale of E major. But probably what it's doing is like your sample might be really reiterating or or, or focusing in on um, what's what would be a horrible note in. E. Oh God! Um, yeah, it might be like it. It might be like on the seventh of the scale, which doesn't sound that nice. Um, but if you, if it can be in key, it can be like like it can be in the same scale as the rest of your piece of music. But if it's like hammering out a note that isn't that nice compared to what you've got around it, that's why it'll throw it off. And that sample will start making you like re re like reassess where the tonal center is and then it might change to like F sharp and then actually you're hearing notes that aren't in the F sharp scale. Does that make sense? Whether it's minor or major. Um, I think what, I've, what I will do to get around that is do um, a lot of pitching up and down of stuff. Um, I think like, I, hopefully you kind of got that, like just the, the speed that I was kind of like pitching the drums um, and, and the vocals at the start. Like, I could keep layering stuff and what the first thing I do is always pitch it up and down sort of like, and, and you'll know when it clicks and I think like everyone's got oh like tuners yeah tuners crap absolutely crap yeah uh, if I'm really really struggling what I will use is a auto tune plugin and they're not always the best where is it if I put this on at my like if I wanted to work out what key my vocal's in, um, I'll whack it on my vocal. Let's do that now. I'll turn the vocal down as well so we don't kill ourselves. Cool. Oh, that's the shaker. Um, here's the vocal. Cool. So we can see the vocals hitting these. Cool. You can see the vocals basically like hitting these notes. Don't know what's going on with this one down here. Ignore that. But we can see it's mainly hitting G, B flat, and C. Um, and then what I might do is go on this site called Scale Finder. Um, if I, if my music theory is really rusty as well, um, not this site, I don't know what that site that is. There's a really good one which just, is it like keys maybe? Scalar, is that a site? I, I mean... Yeah, I think what this, yeah, what this site I'm using, what this site I'm looking for is, oh, here we go. So I think what were the notes? I think it was that, that, and that. Cool. And then it'll basically just show you what scales those notes are basically in. Um, and then you can start to like, if you're using Splice, you've got that vocal going around, you can basically start throwing in stuff. You know, you can whack stuff in that's in D sharp major and it's going to go with that vocal. Stuff in F major, stuff in G sharp major, stuff in A major. Um, don't worry about the pentatonics. Um, but you can also start looking at stuff like modes as well, which will be down here where it's getting like a bit tasty sounding. Like we talked about like the Phrygian mode being the kind of techno scale. Um, I think, yeah, but just bear in mind as well that like each of these scales are going to have a very different kind of effect on that vocal as well. Um, but yeah, I think like 
my big tip if you want to kind of find the notes would be the tuner plugins are terrible they only really work on like on really clean sort of sounds so you but you can see how quickly this these notes are changing and this just gives you like a little kind of indication that I don't even know if it is B flat it might even be B no it's B, it's B flat um, but yeah hopefully that kind of helps but I recommend getting an, an auto tune plugin where it'll just kind of read stuff but you can write that on you can write that on anything let's see if it works on the break I was going to say quickly I, I really struggle with that as well but like say if you just had a sample like say like a bass note or like a pad or whatever from that jungle sample pack what if you were actually just trying to find the root note of that sample because I know that in the sampler you can like actually change what the root note is can't you like would would there be a way that you do that would you use like the auto tuner pl plugin again just to like actually figure out what the root note is and then change it because I know you had that terrorist bass that you'd yeah. already yeah, yeah, made. Yeah. Had you done something like that? Uh, with the terrorist bass, I am pretty sure the way frequencies work, there's actually not that much difference between really, really low notes because like for like, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go too far into that. Um, but I'm pretty sure I use the tuner for the bass. When it comes to like pads and stuff, I will get like a piano out maybe. So I've, I've literally got like a a... Uh, grand piano pl uh, like preset that I've made where is it is it house piano maybe and then I'll just I'll just play this over the top and it's like a nice pure sound lovely um, and then yeah I'll just I'll just basically do that until I'm like yeah cool that's definitely kind of the, the fundamental note of that and then I'm like okay cool if E is the main note it's probably going to be an E major or E minor and then I can just kind of like either look up a scale online or if I know the scale which I'm pretty sure I do I don't know how to play it on a music on like a computer keyboard but like I'll just experiment and see what kind of notes work from there um, if that makes sense there, there is like a, a um, audio to MIDI thing in Ableton as well so like if you dragged in some like a pad um, like this let's just get like the jungle jungle one back up uh, this is this is sorry. This is a really good way of, of finding out the notes. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Um, I'll get like a cool. All right, let's try that. I mean, that's like really harmonically interesting. It's it's definitely something which has been resampled and pitched down. Um, so that might be quite hard to play along on a keyboard. But what you can do is if you got yeah, that'd be a chord. Yeah. So what you, what you can do in Ableton is just drag it into here and choose to convert it to harmony. Um, and then you should, in theory, get the MIDI of the chord. There we go. Um, but I think, you, I mean, you can do that with vocals as well. Let's try it with the vocal and see. But yeah, I would never ever do the harmony one. Do, sorry, do the melody one. Do the harmony one and then just delete the notes. They always need a bit of clearing up. That didn't sound like the vocal. <laughs> cool, maybe, maybe you can't do it with the vocals. We know that now. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's no worries. Super helpful. Yeah. You have to be very careful though, because what you're looking for is the fundamental frequency, which is the first um, the first kind of wave because oh, I'm not entirely sure. I know that if you like distort a guitar, it the, the harmonics it creates are actually like major thirds. Um, so you have to be really careful with that because the this these notes that are... Um, I mean, that might be the note just there, but like that spike there will not be the same note, I imagine. And like these ones here will probably not be the same note as well. So just be very, very careful with that. Like I th what you want to use... I think what someone told me once is use the bottom, the bottom fundamental. So I'm, actually, I think it'd be that one just like down there should be the right frequency. I mean, we can put, we can put a spectrum analyze one and find out, couldn't we? And then you, you'll prove me wrong and you'll win. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm playing, I'm playing an F and that is not working. Let's try this one here. Oh yeah, cool. All right. F. That's an E. That's also an F. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a C sharp, okay. So it's definitely not always the case. Yeah, that's gone to an A. That, that I think was an F as well. So yeah, maybe it's like the first big point you can use as well. It's not always that easy to do though if you've got like a sample or a chord because the, the frequencies can like muddle together kind of at the bottom. Um, 
but yeah, like MIDI, uh, audio to MIDI is a really good way. Auto tune just to see like the stuff moving live. Um, yeah. Sweet, we got another ten minutes. Anyone else got a question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's jump in. Um, one thing that I think is really important is um, that I don't know. I don't think enough people do is uh, group process their drums. Um, I'm really tempted to like put a kick in here to show you all a trick. Let's do it. I'm gonna do go so quick. Um, this is a kick I use in loads of tracks, which is from Floating Points' is remix of Back to Basics. Um, but it's the best kick I've ever heard. It's got a hi-hat after it. We don't like the hi-hat. I'm pretty sure I've actually even made like a preset where it's the basics kick. There we go. Cool. I haven't even taken the hi-hat off. And I've EQ'd it. Cool. Um, I'm just going to add a quick kick, kick pattern in here. Um, and then I'm going to show you what I kind of do when I, when I group process uh, drums, especially breaks. Sorry, Alex, for dropping your microphone. Sure, why? The kick isn't working. Oh, samples offline. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. It's just whack. Sorry, everyone. That's pretty good for first sort of technical hitch of the day, I think. Yeah, I'd say it's all been pretty smooth so far. Watch it crumble at the last minute. There we go. Okay, cool. Kick should be in there now. It's like, it's a weighty, weighty kick. Um, yeah, I'm just going to like, I could listen and just like tweak to work out where my kick comes. Or I could literally just look on the thing here. I might want to do like a slightly different rhythm. I actually think I won't do the, 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 the kind of stutter at the start. Let's just whack that kick in there now. Um, cool. Let's listen to the break all together as well. Okay, cool. Um, basically, what I do is I whack this amazing compressor on all my drum groups called... Um, it's basically modelled after a... Um, like a Poltec um, Opti compressor. They're apparently apparently it's, a, it's meant for vocals, but I just like use this kind of like punch, uh, this drum punch preset and it just adds loads of nice saturation and um, the reason why it's really important to put a compressor on is it just makes your drums just gel quite a lot it means when your kick pushes through your hi-hats like saturate and that can be so so nice to hear like a drum break and like a drum group just kind of like squeezing against itself um, it's very easy to over compress stuff and that sounds rubbish um, but there's it's all about finding that kind of sweet spot You can already, I, I'll do like an A, B, I'll turn it off and on so you can kind of hear the difference. Cool, so hopefully you can kind of hear it's like, it's just a bit tougher, it's all kind of flowing into each other. Um, one thing I do quite a lot as well, if I'm making stuff with like, uh, more like drum machines, maybe like some speed garage, is I'll run everything through a compressor. Uh, sorry, a saturator. Don't know why I said that. Um, which is great. It squeezes stuff together, but you get this one problem, which is... You can kind of hear that kick is farting. That kick is really like, like, like making that horrible noise. And the reason is, is because, because of how humans hear bass frequencies have to be way louder, which means, you, you, I mean, you can physically see it's way louder on there. Because of that, that is the thing which is going to like be saturated first. Uh, so once again, shout out to Soul Mass Transit System for showing me this. Uh, what you can do is really simply just take the low end down going into the compressor. Um, just give it like a shelf going down uh, and then just basically turn them up after. And he told me that. He told me a main phase that. A main phase was like, oh, okay, cool. He just got out his laptop at like a pub and just started just doing it and just with his headphones on, just complete silence for like five minutes. And I just went, mm, yes, interesting. And just put his laptop away. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a funny guy. Lovely guy though. Uh, cool. And then, yeah, so let's see if this works. And you can hear it's no longer farting, but we're still getting all that nice squeeze. 
Pardon? Yeah, I mean, the EQs are literally just there to take that to take that low end down. So like, have a look at the low end here and I'll put a duplicate spectrum. I'll move the spectrum there so you can kind of see how it's taken that, the low end down. So you can kind of see that's much more kind of square at the top, meaning everything's going to get saturated together and you're not going to have this big kind of farty kick. Uh, there's, 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 yeah, there's other tricks you can do with like inverting phase to like get around, stuff like that. But um, this is just like the cleanest, simplest, easiest, le least in the, uh, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? CPU intensive way I've ever seen. But yeah, I, I do that on, on a lot of like speed garagey, like four, four kick stuff. Uh, Cause it stops it just being kind of like, a bit too farty as it goes along, but with brakes and stuff, yeah, 100% just like a nice tube compressor, just like squashing it down like a few dB, just really pushing it together. Um, I suppose maybe I'll just give you one other like massive trick that I use just, just to maybe end the session, which is uh, side chaining your sends. Um, I was going to do this on the vocal earlier and I completely forgot. Um, if you listen to like this vocal that I sent to that big delay, It sounds really, really messy. And what you can do is, if you just put a compressor after, if you've never heard of side chaining, this is your homework. This is like the, the trick to getting a really, really good mix is basically to have stuff ducking in and out when other stuff is happening. Um, one thing you could do to, to give that much delay and to give that much sense of space without having it just smearing into oblivion, you basically get the get it so the vo vocals side chained against it. Um, so this is the kind of delay vocal. I'm going to turn it down a little bit as well. When this vocal now hits, the delay volume is going to drop down. And it means you hear the vocal really clearly and then the delay rushes in. You still get all the sense of space and the illusion that there's all this delay on it, but you can still hear the vocal clearly. Um, so there it is now again. So you kind of get the delay after. I don't know how well you can hear it. It also means like with this main vocal here, I can send this to the delay as well. Um, and it's not going to kind of muddy up the mix because the delay is going to get dropped down loads while this vocal's going. Um, yeah. Let's try that. Cool. With that. I need to put this... Sorry, what did I put the... Oh, I put in the wrong thing. Sorry, I put. The, I meant to put that on the delay. There we go, cool. Right, I thought that sounded a bit weird. Um, thanks no one for saying anything and hurting my feelings. Uh, cool, right. So now when that vocal hits, on my delay channel, it's basically squeezing it down. So it's doing like minus 17 dBs worth of reduction on it. So I can basically put this delay up and it's just going to fill in the gaps. You can like adjust it to taste. But like all your reverbs, all your delays across any project you do, send them to buses and have them side chain to the main elements. Side chain them to the kick, side chain them to the snare as well, maybe additionally, and side chain them to vocals. I'll regularly have like three or four compressors all on here, just all doing separate side chaining. And it just gets everything to just kind of like meld together and just like, like, like glue together a little bit more. Um, yeah, hopefully you can kind of hear that. That's it with, is it without? Maybe it's not the best example, but hopefully it just gives you kind of an idea of how you can still have all that space from the delay, but without dominating what the actual words are and still being able to hear the words. Cool. Um, I think that's the end now. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It's been really, really good. Thanks for coming, everyone. I feel like I've just sat here and chatted rubbish for about an hour and a half. But um, no, yeah, hopefully it was haven't. useful for you all. Yeah, super useful. All right, I hope everyone has a lovely evening. I think the cube's going to be open for a little bit longer for drinks and stuff. Um, and yeah, big up Nudes, obviously, and also Foot Locker for yeah, putting these wicked series of workshops on.